Um, Mr. Matson or Mr. Tobin? Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Andy Tobin, uh, Jim Matson, my colleague. Uh, we had asked uh, on Friday. We sent in a request for a you, little bit you, more you time. You did, and you did not get a response because Friday's Friday afternoon before Monday's oral argument is not a particularly likable time for us to receive a motion for additional time for oral argument, so you can assume that your motion's been denied. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Um, I'd like to reserve uh, five minutes for uh, rebuttal, if I may. And um, tell us, and, and not, not to take up time from the oral argument, but historically, how is it that you get a case involving different landowners in different keys all in one complaint? Because I just don't understand this. Well, uh, that was a uh, sort of litigation strategy that uh, it would be more economical to have uh, one appraiser and one trial, and, and, and since we had uh, BUDs that were sort of lumped together as well, don't forget in an inverse case, the first part is liability. Is there yes, a taking yes, well, no, the, the second, second part phase? is compensation. Uh, we've done a gazillion of these, right? In hindsight, I don't think we're ever going to combine. I would not think I've ever, I would ever see this again. And I assume the county didn't object. We were all, we're, we were, over the past 20 years, we've been learning. And I don't, I, we learned some lessons. And, okay. And, okay. But well, let, right. let's go through this because now what we're faced with is one case involving different landowners. And I guess the best thing you can do for us is go through them one by one and tell us because okay. what you have is a situation that you seem to rely on the beneficial use determination process and somehow believe that that entitles you to some sort of inverse condemnation claim, but you have cases within this very rubric where people received permits. They, they, they had a net, uh, an adverse determination uh, made under the bud process, but some of them filed for a permit and received a construction permit, right? More or less correct with one, with one caveat. In Monroe County, you apply for a permit after four years or five years or six years or seven years, and you apply for beneficial use or you apply for uh, administrative relief. The, the Board of County Commissioners has the discretion at that point to grant you a permit or to say we are going to buy your piece of property. In this particular case, the three people that got permits applied for relief after so many years of being in the process and were told you cannot use your land. As we went into the second year, the third year, the fifth year of this lawsuit, the county changed its mind and granted a permit. So that should not be an indication that people who receive an absolute flat out decision, which is recognized in Collins 1, that you cannot use your land, while that is not an inverse condemnation on its face, the inquiry at that point is you cannot use your land. The remand. R remind us, Collins 1 was the facial takings case yes. versus the as applied. I yes. sat on that one in the keys with Judge Suarez, if I recall, and the county made a claim that they could have a facial taking. We reverse saying no, it has to be as applied to each parcel. Correct. Okay. An as applied taking, however, can be partial or it can be total. Lucas says that when you have been denied all use, Completely, not partial, but all use. You treat but, but where's your proof of that? Let's go through this. The BUD. Let, let, let's go through this. You've got to do it property by property because that's the only way we can review this. We can't do a blanket determination. The BUD applies to all properties. So when the county says... What case says a denial, a, a, a favorable determination in the BUD process gets you a finding of liability? Does any case say that? No. Okay. And so, I'll, and so since no case says that, go through each property, if you will, with us, if you're prepared to do so, on the Lumrance property, the Toss property, go through them and tell us what was done because... I will. I will. But let me preface going through each property because, because all these properties basically have the same thing. 
The government says you can't use your land. The next inquiry is, is the land usable? And that's what the remand, is it a compensable taking? We already know it's a final decision of the government. You cannot use your land. So the remand is, is it usable? If the answer is yes, it's usable, then the next phase is, what is the amount of the compensation? So when this court remanded this case back and and said in its decision, in this case, the BOCC concluded, pursuant to the BU ordinance and after public hearing, that there was no further beneficial use of the properties and that the county should purchase them, that is the government saying you cannot use your land. The remand, I, I, again, what you're getting us to do is you're trying to get us to the point of making a decision that says that a favorable determination under the BUD process means the county's liable. No. And I don't think we're prepared to go there. I, and, I'm not going, and I'm not going there. What I, will, what I will point to is that Judge Slayton ignored, ignored, the, Judge Slayton's mistake was that he he ignored the BUD, and he had a complete trial and did the Penn Central analysis to determine whether or not it's a partial taking or a total taking, and he determined, he made certain finding. In each one of the properties, he found, and specifically in Del Valle on Duck Key and Burston on Duck Key and, uh, and all the people on Duck Key who had platted lots, he said, if I had the power to grant a building permit, I would do so today. That takes the BUD, which says you can't use your property, okay, coupled with the court finding that these are usable properties, therefore, with the BUD. And, and what's the logic of not having sought a building permit on, on the particular lots at issue in this appeal? Who in their right mind would apply for a building permit after the Board of County Commissioners has said you cannot use your land? The three people that got building permits were in the queue for, for many, 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 many years, and after they got a, a, an official resolution saying you can't use your land, the government changed its mind. But nobody in their right mind, after getting an official resolution... But doesn't that improve your case to show that the county is not allowing you to build on that land? I mean, I, I can't see how it would hurt your position. It's, it seems to me to be a win-win. If they deny the building permit, right, then... No, they denied the BUD. The no, B no, no, no. They, 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 they denied the, the BUD, but now let's say you have a permit in addition to this. If they don't let you construct, if they don't give you a construction permit, doesn't it help your case? And if they do, well... You got what you wanted. The three people that got, that were in line, that got a building permit, you are correct. It helps our case when you apply for a building permit, you don't get it, you apply for administrative relief, and they say no, and you sue for a taking. Now I got a double no. That's right. The people who did not apply for building permits, they're in a diff different situation. But, but what precludes you from applying? Is there anything that precludes you from applying from a for fifteen or twenty thousand dollars worth of expenses? Okay, which which were incurred in other cases that we decided in favor of the homeowner, i.e., Galleon Bay, but, right? But suppose somebody wants to sell their land. Who is going to buy land after the BOCC has said you can't use <clears throat> your property? So not everybody in, is in a position that they want to build. How much ripening do you have to do? Don't forget that Williamson County and the other thing says you have to ripen. Apply for at least one. Williamson County is a stranglehold on property owners. They have to apply. You know, with a platted lot, you apply for a building permit, you get turned down. But when you have acreage or things, sometimes the ripening process, you've got to get surveys. You've got to get in for building permits. It, it takes two, three, four years to get all your ducks. But that's what helps your inverse condemnation case, isn't it? We did not believe, and I do not think the law says, that we have to double ripen or triple ripen. And you're well, does the law say that you can have a beneficial use determination and not do much more? Yes. What case says that? You. 
You said — this Court said and, and, and it. In Collins? Yes, sir. In Collins, we did not say that. You remanded it for a trial. We, we remanded it for consideration as to each parcel, whether it was an as-applied taking. Right. But an as-applied take there are no facial takings in, in, in land use because you can always get a variance, you can always get a building permit, you can always change the legislation. Most of the time, a facial — well, it, it's very few times, maybe when the state imposes a statute, a statewide statute, which says there shall be no more uh, building in Dade County, maybe that statute, there's no administrative remedy to that. There's no exhaustion to that. But in local government, there's always a, a variance. There's always the possibility the Planning Commission will change things. So when Your Honor, when this Court remanded to determine is it a compensable taking, you had already written in your decision that the Board of County Commissioners had said no in an official resolution. Right, again, but no beneficial use determination. Could you not get a, a, a finding of no on a bud and still your property be a taking for lobster traps? Say that again, sir. Could you get a favorable determination on the bud and find a determination at the trial court that you do, you, you, you have a condemnation, but it's for lobster traps, not for residential homes? Lucas and Kuntz say no. Lucas, the Supreme Court, has said when the government says like in, in, in Lucas, one of the arguments was that you can still go camping on your land. And Lucas said, in the context of his, the history of our takings jurisprudence, if, you, if the government says you cannot use your land because of a coastal construction line, what, what the dissent was arguing, well, that's really not a taking. You could still camp on it. You could still sell it. You could still sell it to a piece of, to your neighbors. So there is... Uh, and some but if you bought the property knowing that it was never going to be developed property. Yes, sir. It was always going to be for some other use, be yes, it sir. camping or lobster traps. Yes, How sir. can there be a taking if years later you're simply using it for camping and lobster traps? You are correct. If the land is not usable because it's underwater, I buy a piece of property and my intent is I'm just going to camp on it because I'm, I, can, I can afford it. Or I'm going to buy thousands of acres of pine lands in northern Florida and, and, and extract pine tar. Or I've, I've got lots of cows, so I'm going to just use this as grazing land. And 20 years later or 30 years later, my circumstance change. The town moves out. The shopping centers are being built. Now I want to come in and get a permit. And, and, and the government says, wait a second. You bought this for grazing cows. We're not going to let you do it. That is not part of, of zoning law. It's not part of our, of, 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 of it's, it's just not, it, it's foreign to our system of, of democracy and capitalism. So, so the, so when Lucas, when Lucas says, once the government says, no, you can't use your land completely, and that's what we have here in the bud, the analysis is to treat it as a physical occupation, and you don't have the Penn Central analysis. Okay, there's only been a 50% diminution. Yes, you could have 10 acres. You could have 10 well, units but, to the acre. <clears throat> that you can have. But counsel, I mean, didn't we already decide? Didn't this court already decide in Collins that this wasn't a per se taking? That you had to go back and litigate the issue parcel by parcel of what uses were available. When you say per se taking, that's a facial taking. Wasn't okay? a uh, which I kind of think of as a Lucas taking. Categorical taking. Okay? There's a facial taking, okay, where the regulation says you can't use your land. Okay? Then there's an as-applied taking. Uh, assume Judge Logue taught Florida constitutional law as I did, and we know exactly what the they mean, and, and Judge the, Emus as well. The zoning this. in Monroe County does not say you cannot use your land. That, so it is not a facial taking. But I guess this, it's, it looks to me like um, <clears throat> the landowners tried the case on the basis of they brought in an expert appraiser, an outstanding appraiser. Yes, sir. And they just said, this is what the land would be used if it wasn't subject to these regulations. It's usable land. Right. In other words, if, if the land wasn't subject to the current regulations, it would be worth X. But I, I thought the analysis was supposed to be subject to the regulations. Is there any economic use at all this land? The In other words, if you put this on the market, what would the cost? What, what would it yield? 
Zero. Okay. Was Week there evidence one? of that? Okay. Let me just stop you, counsel. Yes, there was evidence. Okay. Did someone testify yes. that if you put this on the market, yes, the 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 yes. value would be zero? Yes. All right. The appraiser said anybody, okay, because you have an official resolution from Monroe County which says you can't use your land, I have to value it as unusable land, and he gave a nominal value. To get back Was to there any attempt to market these properties? Nobody buys land that the government says you can't use. That's the point. Okay, Why would we the answer sell? is yes or no. I mean, people do buy land that's subject to but judge, extremely why, why would we want to take valuable land and sell it for nominal cost? It's a, it's a, you're, you're, you're suggesting that people who get a no, a platted lot on Duck Key, on a canal, that has a BUD decision, you're suggesting that we should sell it for a pittance to recover our, our full compensation? The Constitution says full compensation and not a penny less. So the But so see, I, Counselor, I think you might be conflating two different issues, if I may. And one issue is, was there a taking? And a separate issue is, if there was a taking, what's the uh, compensation due? Right. <clears throat> Under the issue of was there is a taking, I, my understanding is we have to look at was there n not was the uh, highest and best use reduced because I think there's case law saying you could reduce the highest and best use by 95 percent. The only issue is is there an economic use left based upon investment backed expectations? The answer is no. And it sounds the answer is no because so, the government said you can't use your land. They quit the well, one of the uses is selling it. That's the Lucas, main use. Lucas says that's not a use. Lucas didn't say that. Lucas, Lucas, exactly Lucas did not say that. that. Lucas, Lucas exactly says Lucas that. Lucas did not say that. Okay. Uh, that, at least as I read it. If the, the, the argument in Lucas was use versus value. Everything has value. If you use the taking analysis in the liability phase. Well, counsel, are you saying that if a regulation reduces the highest and best use of land, that's a taking? No, I'm not. And the government. Why not? Why not? Because the government could have said in the BUD, we're going to let you use your land. We're going to let you use half your land. We're going to let you use a quarter of your land. So you're, and I, you know, you're, you're relying on the BUD to prove that there was a taking. I'm relying yes. on the BUD as the final decision of the government as to use. The next question is, is it usable? If it's underwater, okay, or we bought it just for grazing or something like that, then there's a possibility that a trial judge would analyze it and say, you know something, like the uh, Burgess case. You bought 160 acres of brackish water. It's a non-compensable taking. We've let you go way past your Thank time. Thank you. I so really appreciate it. And you'll, you'll, still, you'll still have some time for rebuttal, and we'll give the county and the excellent uh, argument and excellent the state. Briefs. Thank uh, you very much. The equal amount of time. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court. John Glogow from the Attorney General's Office on behalf of the state. Uh, Derek Howard from the county is with me. I'd like Are to. Are you splitting your time? Or? Yes, sir. I was okay. just going to say I'd like to reserve some time for the county to sure. address the court. Um, I would look, um, Your Honor, I, Mr. Tobin uh, very, very assiduously avoided doing exactly what you asked him to do, which was to address we, we these on, on parcel by parcel basis. If I might make one or two general comments, and then I will do exactly what you've asked. Um, first of all, um, Mr. Gallagher, the property appraiser for the um, plaintiffs, testified that because the BUDs did not allow any use, he, addressed, he appraised the property as if there was no use and gave it a value of $1,000 an acre. Lucas, the, the, the commentary in Lucas itself was, it's going to be a very rare occasion to find a Lucas taking because the idea that land will have no value whatsoever is kind of hard to imagine. And I frankly think, Your Honor, that if you search the databases, you will find almost no, if actually no, Lucas takings that have ever been affirmed. Okay. The, if I can interrupt. And I, yes. Uh, the, is the BUD an admission against interest that, where the county admitted there's no use? 
No, Your Honor. Because that's um, pretty strong language in that BUD. It that, is, Your that's Honor. That's the county commission saying there's no use of this property in our county. Your Honor, I have two answers to that. The first is that this court in the Collins case, based on what happened with two of the plaintiffs, Mr. Collins and Mr. McGreeny, found that, in fact, the BUDs did not finally determine that there were no uses for these properties. Contrary to plaintiff's assertion here, Mr. Collins and Mr. McGreeny got those permits in the ordinary course of business. The county didn't change its mind. They were in the queue, and when they rose to the top of the queue, they got their permits. They, they were in the queue because of the point system down there? That's correct. Okay. Right. So the, the — Why the, did the county commission then pass those resos saying there's no use? The testimony at the trial — Why didn't the county commission just say, we're, we're welcome — we would like to purchase these properties? Why did they say there — and there is no use of this property? Your Honor, first of all, the testimony at the trial was that the BUDs in this case were an accommodation made by the county to help these landowners out. Some of them had been in the queue for a long time. Some of them were being held up by a moratorium. Remember, maybe you're not aware, but there was a moratorium in place because of the level of service on US-1. That, that moratorium, we didn't know when it was going to end because the federal government had to issue the permits to do the improvements on US-1. So the county said, we don't know when we're going to be able to issue you these permits so we will accommodate you, and by agreement, and this is test uncontested testimony, by agreement, the county issued the BUDs. Now, the reason the language that you're concerned about is in the BUD is because the only way the county, under the ordinance, could offer to buy the property is based on that finding. So it was all done by agreement. There was no evidentiary hearing. But There's if never by, been a if, finding if, that those if, properties if can't be built on. If it's by agreement, then why doesn't it get, you would think, that the next step would be BUD, okay, let's determine valuation and let's pay. No? Your Honor. Why, why, why are we wrong Because on that? the plaintiffs didn't come in and negotiate with us. And they, they ran to the courthouse with the BUDs saying they took our property. That's why we're here. So, Your Honor, if you look at the individual. And why, aren't they, why aren't they right? If the board said that they were deprived of all economic use, why is that not binding? on a determination that there was a taking and all that's left is to value it. Because, Your Honor, in Collins and McGreeny, those two plaintiffs got building permits. How about for the rest? Well, let me, if I can finish, they got building permits after the BUDs. The trial judge, in this case, issued summary judgment as to them, right. and this court affirmed. Okay. So, can it, well, and then can it be used as some evidence? Can the board's action or determinations <clears throat> be used as some evidence? Obviously not binding necessarily, but well, why okay, can't it? Well, okay, if you want to go that route, then all of the evidence that was presented at the trial as to the actual uses available on the properties, the judge then gets to balance that evidence and find that the evidence that there were uses available outweighs that evidence. So uh, a determination that there is no, uh, that they've been deprived of all economic use does not necessarily answer the full question, which is whether there's been a take. Whether there's, there still has to be that intermediary, that, right. that now, determination of a taking, which means is the property, does the property remain does the usable? Property, yes, Your Honor. And Mr. Tobin's statement that you had the BUD and then they found that the property was usable and therefore there's a taking is completely upside down. If you find that the property is usable and was usable at the time, then there's no taking. Let's use the Big Pine Key properties as a good example. There are two owners of properties on Big Pine Key, Mr. Radenhausen and Mr. Johnson. They got the BUDs. They're exactly the same place that Mr. Collins and Mr. McGreeny were, except that they never applied for a building permit. Right. Had they gotten in the queue, they would have gotten building permits, just like Collins, McGreeny, and 90 other lots on Big Pine Key when the moratorium was lifted. So how can that be a taking if the only reason they didn't get a permit was, A, there was a temporary moratorium in place, and B, they never applied for it? With respect to the Duck Key properties, the Devalle and uh, Mr. Burston, those two are platted single-family lots on Duck Key. Their own biologists testified that those were buildable lots. That's what Judge Slayton found. He found that those, if had they applied for a building permit, they might could have gotten them. And so how, do, how can you say there's a taking when you could have gotten a permit? Well, I mean, could have gotten or will get? 
Well, Your Honor, we, we can't sit here and predict. That's why in takings law, and this, there's no ripeness issue in this case, but that's why in takings cases there is a ripeness requirement. You've got to make the application. We can't predict, you speculate, if you will, as to what the local government's going to do with these applications. You've got to give them a chance to do it. And they didn't do that here. Now, with respect to the Hill property, the Hills bought their property. Their own testimony was that they bought the property for parking and for trap storage for their fish house. The finding of fact, based on competent substantial evidence, was that use is still available to them. <coughs> if you buy property for a specific use and you can still use it for that, Burgess is very clear that that's not a taking. It can't be. So I've done five of the seven now. Um, Mr. Toss owns eight acres. He bought it for investment purposes. His testimony for investment purposes. He bought it in 1968 and did nothing for 30 years. Now, idleness for 30 years is not dispositive. I'm not saying that it is. But it's certainly evidence of his intentions. And his intentions was to buy and hold. And when you buy and hold speculative real estate investments, the cases say that the Constitution does not ensure your speculative real estate investments. So the testimony at the, at the trial was that that property does retain value. Maybe not as much as he would have liked, but it does retain value. So if you invest in property and you lose money on your investment because you sit on it for 30 years, inadvisably it turns Did, out. Was there evidence at trial what the Tosk property was worth subject to the regulations? Yes. Uh, Trent Marr, our appraiser, did testify. I don't know the exact numbers, Your Honor. Give me a ballpark. Um, the Tosk property was worth 15 cents. Um, maybe Mr. Worth Howard can find it for me. 25,000? Uh, Mr. Mean, Marr was, of course, the same fellow with the lobster storage in the Galleon Bay, if I recall, right? That's correct, Your Honor, but there's no questioning his, his – there's nothing that's been questioned he, as to his appraisal in this case. Did your, did your appraiser present values? Yes, absolutely. said the fair market value of these properties fair market is values. Tax for each property at, without the regulation and with the regulation, just like the cases say, so that you can determine the diminution in value, which is one of the prongs of the Penn Central case. Penn Central, the second prong of Penn Central, maybe the first prong in some, in some cases, is what is the diminution in value? And we presented that evidence. Plaintiffs did not. So speculative real estate investment, Mr. Mr. Tost, he sat on it for 30 years. And in Lom Mr. Lomrantz, they were offered at one point $144,000, and they turned that down. Right. Now, Mr. Lomrantz is another interesting uh, factual situation. Here's a man that buys four substandard lots in what we call a paper subdivision. This is a plat that was recorded many years ago. It clearly was part of one of the buy a bunch of Florida swamp land boiler room operations that, that we're all familiar with. It was platted during a time where all you had to do was draw a bunch of lines on a piece of paper and record the plat. So this plat is out there. He buys four lots. There has never been a house built on this subdivision. None. There's one across the road on another subdivision, but this subdivision has never been developed. There's no infrastructure. There's no utilities. There's nothing there. He paid $6,000 for four lots. The, the very small amount of that price is an indication that those properties are not developable. You can't, you can't, get, you can't buy a, a property for so little and not be on notice that there's a problem with it. So the judge looked at these facts and found that he was, in fact, a real estate speculator. And he did, made no effort whatsoever to develop the property. So once again, this we is, do so not this, this clearly comes within the, uh, the real estate speculator exception to the Fifth Amendment. Well, <laughs> no, it's not an exception to the Fifth Amendment. It's, it's a, I mean, it's, you know, you're, you're throwing around the term real estate speculator as if it was something bad. It's a no, good I'm, thing, right? The people that invest, people invest in land, we like that, right? No, Your Honor, I'm not saying that it's something it's one bad. Of our it, drives, it certainly drives the economy to a certain extent. What I'm saying is if you buy land, as a land speculator, and you make no effort to use the land or do anything with it, when the value of the land goes down, you've, your speculation has, has not panned out for you, but the government, the cases say that the government's not an insurer of that investment. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I'm not too crazy about that argument because 
of course the government's not an insurer of your investment, but the whole issue here is whether the government regulations are limiting the value of the land. Well, Your Honor, Mr. Mr. Lomrance bought four lots. All four, the four lots at the time he bought them were substandard under the code. He could not have built on them. Even if you aggregated all four of them together, they were still too small on the date that he bought it to build on. Okay, according to your appraiser at trial, what was the value of those four parcels? Uh, excuse me, may I? Sure. I'm sorry, Your Honor, those numbers are not in our briefs. We can, they're in the record, and okay, I certainly in the record, can provide can. you with citations to the record where all those numbers are. You don't need to, if they're in the record. But I, the, but I, I would like to be sure. That if I look in the record, I will see the fair market value for each of these. Absolutely, Your Honor. Look at Trent Marr's testimony. He provided before and after values for every property. Thank you, Counsel. And, but once again, with Mr. Lomerantz, if you buy a piece of property for a song, substandard at the time you buy it, there's no proof that he could have gotten a variance to build on them. Later on, when you can't build on them, how can you complain that that's a taking? If you and can bring your argument to a close, since we still have to hear from the county. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, basically, the two things. As a general matter, this court has already found in Collins 1 that the BUDs did not constitute facial or, ad or, or facial takings, as the plaintiffs argue. It's law of the case that I don't think they can argue it. There's no ripeness issue here. The court treated the cases as ripe and did exactly what this court instructed it to do. That is, Judge Slayton tried this case under the Penn Central factors, made specific findings of fact based on competent substantial evidence as to each property, and found that as to these seven plaintiffs, there were no takings. And I think the court needs to affirm. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll be extremely brief. Your Honors, I just wanted to point out for the panel um, the specific language in the Collins 1 decision uh, that forecloses the idea that the uh, BUD uh, decisions that were, in fact, rendered by the Board of County Commissioners were admissions of takings. And this is from this Court's Collins 1 decision. And that decision states, the record shows that the enactment of the regulation did not deprive the landowners of all reasonable economic use of their property. There is evidence in the record that a subset of the landowners received post-BUD building permits or even sold their property. This is strong evidence that those particular properties did, in fact, have development value, that that value of those properties was not completely eliminated by application of the 2010 Comprehensive Plan and contradicts the findings of the Special Master and the Board of County Commissioners that a facial taking occurred. That is therefore the reason why this court was extremely specific in its remand instruction to the trial court. It said, on remand, you try these not as Lucas takings. And let's be clear, Lucas takings are, depending on what you call them, you can call them total takes, you can call them facial takings, Lucas takings, they're the same thing. It's where all value has been eliminated by application of the regulation. What this court found was that despite the beneficial use determinations that were rendered by the county, that there was evidence that these properties, in fact, had value. That's why it told the trial court, you must analyze these claims as as-applied claims under Penn Central. And under Penn Central, this court got it right. It said you look at two factors. You look at the reasonable investment-backed expectations of each of the landowners, and you look at the economic impact. Now, when you look at the economic impact um, of the regulation on the particular property, you've got to do two things. You've got to first look at the fair market value of the property with the regulation, and then compare that with the fair market value of the property without the regulation. That is the only way that you can isolate the economic impact of the regulation on the claimant. Now, what do we have in this case? When this got kicked back down to the trial court, there is no evidence in the record whatsoever on the economic impact of the regulations on these claimants because their appraiser admitted at trial that he never appraised these properties with the regulation. That is, um, that is an admission um, at 769-70. Um, he explained what he did instead was based on legal instruction. He appraised the properties as though they were useless. And, and let, refresh our memory. Collins 1 was decided when? In 2000? 2008, Your Honor. 2008. And this case was tried in 2000? 2000... 2011, Your Honor. 11. And in the meantime, so after the remand, 
Did it go back for additional discovery and so forth? Absolutely, Your Honor. Um, it did. And, uh, you know, within that period of time, um, in fact, you know, some of the um, – the evidence that this court uh, recognized in Collins one that hey you know these properties despite this you know these BUDs that were rendered which we now know at trial um, there was substantial testimony that this was something where the county was trying to help these landowners out that they that they represented that they wanted offers to purchase and the only way that they could go through the BUD process and get that relief that they claimed they wanted was unfortunately for the the board of county commissioners to make this finding that there had, in fact, been, you know, a deprivation of economic use. county might want to look at using that type of language. Well, I, I certainly would say it, uh, it would never happen under my watch, Your Honor, but there was a record as to well, why. Well, no, that was unique to Monroe County, and this, it, whole, this exactly. whole bud process. And again, that, that idea that it was an admission has been foreclosed and, by Collins And I would one. think even though you were on the sort of the adverse side of Galleon Bay, and I know I certainly gave you a very hard time on Just Galleon Bay, <laughs> this case is frankly very different very than different, Galleon right. Bay. In fact, it's the complete it, opposite where you have a land, yeah. the, all these that spent minimal right. amounts very little reliance on the county's part or right. the state that these were going to be buildable lots, right? It's night and day, Your Honor. The, the fact of the matter is in, in Gallia Bay, you did have a developer who was making an effort to develop the property. Um, you Spent could only considerable sums, if I recall correctly, hundreds of thousands of dollars. That was the dollars. finding of this court, Your Honor. And, but it, 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 it puts forward the, the simple principle that you can only get what you ask for. And in this case, the remaining sets of plaintiffs, the reason that they didn't get anything is because they didn't ask for it. The Collins and McGreeny, why did they get building permits? Because they asked for them. It's that simple. And it's not a ripeness issue. What the court found was that for uh, five of the seven remaining um, plaintiffs, that the development potential of the properties today is the same as when they purchased the properties years ago. So it's not saying that you know, this case isn't right because you didn't apply for building permits. What it's saying is that if you put this on the market, there would be market value because, in fact, whatever you bought the property for is something that the, the person on the market could buy the property for today. And in addition to that finding, the court also found that there were, you know, there was rogo lot value and TDR value. And um, in the good case, um, that court clearly said that um, that is a value that must be considered because uh, I think, Your Honor, you, you got it correct when you said the standard is not in an inverse combination takings case whether you can or cannot do what it is you want to do with the property. The issue is whether there is value remaining in the property upon application of the regulation. Not whether you've been denied uh, highest and best use, but whether you've, whether you've been denied any use to which um, you know, could there could be that can be economically Denied executed correctly? So what you have in this case is you have appraisal testimony from not only did you have their appraiser admitting that they didn't appraise the property with the regulation, so therefore no way can they uh, you know maintain their evidentiary burden. But then you have uh, you know the defense putting forth appraisal testimony that tells you there is in fact value remaining with application of the regulation. Um, both because of the development potential that exists today, the same as it existed yesterday, and the uh, transfer of develop development rights value and the rogue lot value. And there's nothing that precludes them from, after this case is done, to go in and apply for building permits. Nothing at right? all, Your Honor. And with that, I'll um, ask that this Court affirm the uh, trial judge's uh, verdict. Thank you. Mr. Tobin, Mr. Matson. Mr. Matson is going to uh, wrap up. Very, very briefly. Uh, first of all, these resolutions that were written in uh, 2002, they're very, very um, simple, straightforward. It is determined that the applicant has been deprived of all economic use of their property and the appropriate remedial action is just compensation by purchase of the lot in accordance with the applicable provisions of the plan and the code. Now, that meant that we had um, – we had four years from the time of this resolution to get up and file a lawsuit if the county didn't want to actually buy the property. Well, the county didn't make any effort to buy the property, and we filed the lawsuit in 2004. Your Honor, uh, I'm going to do what Andy 
neglected to do, which was to talk about each individual lot. Very well, you quickly. don't have the time to do that, unfortunately, right now. So you what? have about you have about two or three minutes left. Well, I can actually give us your best. You give us your one best. I can, do, I can I can hit these. Duck Key, the two properties on Duck Key, those lots were designated red flag wetlands, and red flag wetlands cannot be altered, and you can't build on them. Um, Hill, same thing. Red flag wetlands. You can't build on them. Doesn't make any difference. These re and these regulations went into place uh, after the 1986 comprehensive plan. Um, the Hills bought in 84. And in 84, they could have built on that property. In 86, the county changed the rules. Same thing with uh, Duck Key. We had, we had purchasers in 87 and in 90. Um, and, the, and those rules changed not only. And, and, and the answer would be this. Under our decision in Collins 1, yes. can you now not go to seek a building permit? It would be fruitless. Why? Because you can't build in a red flag wetland, period. There are no exceptions. So you're suggesting then that the trial court should have found as a matter of law that those properties, the owners of those properties, were deprived of all economic use That's by correct. the regulation. That's correct. And let me as a matter of law, no evidentiary issue right. to be determined. Right. No valuation pre or post regulation. Correct. And what did the trial judge find? The, tri <laughs> the trial judge's order is one that boggles the mind, I'm afraid. It, um, it is a rambling series of statements where the judge drove around the keys and looked at things, and I can't make anything out of the trial judge's order. Um, I want to comment on Mr. Lomrance, who I think has been, had been maligned here today. Was there evidence in the Hill properties that they were purchased with reasonable investment-backed expectations and demonstrated in the evidence what those investment-backed expectations were and what actions were taken uh, in reliance upon those expectations well, or in furtherance in of the them? In the case of the Hills, who bought an 84. Those are the red flags, right? That was a red flag. Right. The three lots, there were red flag. In 1984, there was a moratorium that had been imposed in 83, and so nobody was able to do anything. Well, they bought then knowing there was a moratorium and they couldn't build on it. There was a, there was a moratorium across the whole county, which started in, I think, 83, uh, early 83. So but basically nothing was developed from 83 to 86. Okay. And but I'm asking what evidence there was in the record of actions taken in furtherance of their investment-backed expectations to show that they were reasonable. I... Uh, I really can't remember all of the testimony, but I know that we put on the president of um, Key Largo Fisheries as a witness, and I'm going to assume that it was in with, within his testimony, okay. since he would have been instructed to, to do so. Um, I, I want to address Mr. Lomrance, who, who deserves a better fate than what he's gotten so far today. He purchased these lots in 1981. And in 1981, there was no moratorium. Um, Monroe County had a set of regulations, land development regulations, that, that covered these acreage areas. So there was an ac a huge amount of acreage, I think maybe 900 lots or 500 lots. It was a large, large number of acreage, large amount of acreage. And the Monroe County Code in 1981 and going back to 1960, the first, the first Monroe County Code was, was in 1960. There, there are some suggestions here in, in Collins' case that we didn't have any land development regulations, but we did. And the rule was that if, if, you, had a plat, if you had a platted lot in one of these large areas that hadn't really been developed yet, that you would be allowed to build one house per lot. And that's what Mr. Lomrance was able to, that's why he purchased the lot. I don't think that he was a crazy speculator. There are some, we have some 
nutty people in the Keys who. And is there evidence what he did in furtherance of that expectation when he bought in 81? He didn't do anything, but there was already a road. Doesn't that make it an issue for the court to determine whether he acted in furtherance of those expectations and whether those expectations were reasonable? Well, I don't think in, in a single family lot situation there's much you can do. Um, he had, they had, they had roads cutting in that subdivision. His four lots were paved? on a road. Paved roads? No, they weren't paved roads. They were gravel roads. But, but also he water. was, he was offered a hundred, he bought them for 6,000. He was offered 144,000. I mean, that's an economic use. This I mean, is true. If, if you can sell a piece of property or rent a piece of property, for that I matter, have, have they, get, you know, TDRs out of it, that can be a economic use. So. I guess subject to the regulations, he was offered 144000 That's correct. The, the state of Florida made him an offer. Which, that, that well, so, so which, which brings up another problem I have with what you're, the way you're presenting it, because it's my understanding, looking at these taking issues, we don't look at what's removed. We look at the use that's left. And we look at the use and left and say, subject to all those you know, harsh and draconian regulations, what use is left, in really meaning what value is left. And, and you seem to be focusing on, well, you know, historically there was this one use, and now we don't have that use. But I, the analysis, I think, has got to focus on, well, subject to these regulations, can we sell this property? Well, and here, the only evidence I'm seeing for these particular lots is Buys it for six, sells it at 144. It might not be the the absolute best bargain, but it 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 would seem to support investment-backed expectations. I I understand your point. I understand your point. Um, but I did want to I wanted to make sure that, that people understood that he did have the right to build four homes on those four lots because of. I mean the, when he bought? When he bought. But let's say the regulations are reduced. Uh, and I don't know if this is the case, but let's say now he could only build one. That could still be an economic use. Maybe not what he once had, but it could still be an economic use. Or for that matter, even if he can build none, but it's still a marketable piece of property somehow. Well, now he can, now he can build none. Okay, if you can okay. bring your argument to a close. Right. And in conclusion, you ask us to... <laughs> In conclusion, that I, I ask you to reverse the, the decision below. Um, I realize that there are eight plaintiffs and that uh, some will be treated differently than others. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all.